Hear me okay? All right, well, fantastic. Good morning. Uh, yeah, it's hard. I got to get used to the glasses thing. Sorry about that. Uh, everything's blurry and then it's crisp down here. So we are going to pick up where we left off last week. Uh, go, still going through uh, Colossians. There's, I mean, a lot of good meat here. So we're just going to try to uh, get as much out of this as possible. Hopefully have it be uh, impactful and uh, lead us to growth. But let us start off with... Um, Colossians. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna break it up into two. I'm gonna do one through four, and then we'll circle back and hit the uh, five through ten uh, towards the end. But just starting off with verses one through four, which will be on the board. It says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Let's open a prayer. Father God, we, uh, we just say thank you. We, uh, we study your scripture, and we're just reminded of how much you love us, how much you're willing and wanting and have done for us. Now, Father God, we just pray that you would uh, give us eyes to see your work, your movement around us, that we would have hearts that embrace that and appreciate it appropriately, that we give you the glory for all that you are doing and that we wouldn't try to uh, uh, be self-seeking and say, look what I did, when truly, truly, it is all you. Yeah, we just uh, we invite you into the service. Uh, we invite you into our hearts. Holy Spirit, just move us, grow us, transform us. Let us be more like you as we fixate less on the things of this world and look upward to you and the things that are eternal. And we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, amen. So we start off with verse 1 saying, Keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on this earth. Now, it's a simple statement, but what a vast topic. I mean, this is a topic that we could set up weekly discussion groups to go over the things of the world and the things of, uh, that are above. Um, we can gather together and share. I mean, we could even call it something like celebrate recovery or a multitude of other things as we work through this, this struggle of the things around us and the things that we can't see. And so when I first read this verse, uh, for me, it stirred up a lot of things, uh, a lot of thoughts of this world and, and how it's really negatively impacting our choices and the choices of those around us. Now, last Sunday when I came in before service, I made a comment to uh, Dan, uh, and I think Mike Dunn was here, referencing a viral video that had gone around. And I'm not sure if you guys had seen this, but uh, it's something that I've been just meditating on, and I thought I would share it with you. So the viral video was of a pastor that... Uh, I believe he was in the middle of giving a message. And I want to call it a message because I don't know that the content I witnessed could be classified as a sermon. So it was more of a personal message than a sermon, which I'm going to pause right there. And it made me want to look up, you know, the dictionary definition of sermon and message to make sure that I'm not, you know, blurring the lines there. And so for me, or for the dictionary, a sermon is a talk on a religious or moral subject, especially one uh, given during a church service and based on passages from the Bible. So that's what a sermon is. Um, and then there's a message. And I know that as pulpit supply and as a new pastor, a lot of times I reference what I was doing as a message because I didn't feel worthy to call what I was doing a sermon. 
But thanks to the love and support of you guys and, you know, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm now comfortable saying, let's have a sermon. Um, because this truly is scripturally based. It's not my opinion. I may interweave my opinion once in a while, but it, it needs to be scripturally based. Anyway, so this pastor is up there giving a message. And uh, the message, you know, was pretty hot topic because he was talking about a Movado watch that he wanted. And I don't know if, have anybody seen this, this sermon, this video? Um, so he's up, there. I didn't even know what a Movado watch was until this thing. I'm like, I gotta go Google that and see what it is. And it's a fancy watch. So it's a fancy watch. So um, the ones I saw were, you know, $1,000-ish range, you know. So it wasn't quite Rolexy, it was, but it, was, it wasn't a Timex. And so he was getting up there, and he was really getting into the congregation about, you know, I asked for a watch a year ago, and I, didn't, I still haven't gotten it. Um, in fact, I want to quote how he starts, the video starts off. Now, there's no context. We don't know what happened before. But the video I saw starts off with, um, that's how I know you are still poor, broke, busted, and disgusted because how you've been honoring me. And so, which, you know, if, if you're given a speech or a video, you really want to get people's attention in the first couple of seconds. This gets a lot of attention, which explains why it went viral so quickly. Um, then he goes on to say, uh, ain't I worth your McDonald's money? Ain't I worth your Red Lobster money? Now, I'm really not trying to pass judgment on him because I, I don't know the backstory. Uh, for all I know, this was promised to him as part of his compensation package. Maybe there was commitments made. I don't know, maybe they said, you know, here's a bonus incentive, who knows what? And, and maybe he's just saying, you know, you're not living up to. So I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to judge him because I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, but I know that if I made a mistake like this and it went viral um, and then I repented of it and put a video out, you know, repenting of it, I would hope that this would be used to educate, benefit other saints so that something good can come out of it. So I'm not trying to put them down, but if something good can come out of it, let's talk about it. Um, so, and, and part of the reason why uh, I really don't want to uh, cast stones at him is because there are things in my life that, you know, have not gone viral, but still are not things that I'm especially proud of. Um, I think this video, oh, and here's a picture of the watch if you weren't familiar with them. But I think what we can get from this uh, video, if you were to see it or just from hearing me uh, referencing it, is this is an example of what happens when we don't live verse 2 from what we just read. This is what happens when we don't set our minds on the things that are above. Um, and we focus, rather, on the things of the world. To me, it seems like an example of it. And it's another example of, I mean, we don't know the backstory, but I can say that it's, it's, I think, inappropriate for somebody to use God's pulpit time for personal messages. So I don't know the backstory, but that alone was worth repenting of, in my opinion. But again, not casting stones. Um, so with regards to the things that I will confess of, I first want to say that last Sunday was a beautiful Sunday. And we left here, raced home, had some lunch, changed, and went into downtown Kalama. Because last Sunday was Kalama's car show. And I don't know if anybody's ever been to that car show or any of the local car shows, but I, I appreciate a good car show. I really do. And we jump on the motorcycle so we can get better parking. And we park by the VFW Hall because those are my people and I can park there. 
And the first car we come across that's on display happened to be a 68 Charger. Now, it wasn't this Charger. This one's in a field in downtown Klamath. But I put this up here because this 68 Charger, though it's not the one I used to have, is the same color as the one I used to have. Uh, mine was, it looked so much like this. The, the rims looked the same. It had the black vinyl roof. And so the first car I see is a 68 Charger. And I feel a little nostalgia, you know, of, oh, I remember when. And, you know, I look at this car and I'm like, I really wish I had that again. And I have that little desire bubbling up. And I'll confess that there are times when I'll find myself dreaming of being behind the wheel of that car and the sound of the exhaust pipes, you know, and just going down the road. Um, but I've also had similar dreams behind the wheel of a Shelby Mustang or other nice cars. And then last Sunday as I was leaving here, uh, Mike Dunn was talking about some of his cars. And I found myself visualizing me behind the wheel of a 68 Barracuda with a 360 cubic inch fire breathing uh, power plant. Um, and I kind of like that image too. But I have to realize that I'm now in a dangerous territory where I'm really close to coveting somebody else's treasure. Um, and with regard to the scripture, it's important to realize that my old car, wherever it is now, Mike's car, the cars of the car show, uh, most of them were 50 years old or older. And just like this 50 years old or older shell that I'm walking around in, uh, this too will pass. This too will one day no longer be here. And so while it's, it's good to take care of the things we have, um, we need to have that eternal mindset on what's really of importance and what isn't. And so I found myself thinking about that and preparing for this message. And I started to, um, to really meditate on why, why is it that I find these cars so desirable? Um, why is it that I appreciate them so much? And I came up with a couple of reasons, three to be uh, precise, and um, the first two are pretty good. Uh, third one, maybe not so much. So the first one is history. I appreciate history. I really appreciate automotive history. There's something about automotive history, you know, Ford and the Industrial Revolution, you know, Ford versus Ferrari. Um, I even appreciate the, the rebelliousness of the uh, performance rules that were put in place and how the GTO kind of went around it and launched the whole muscle car movement. I mean, there's so much history in that and I, it's like baseball stats. I kind of like, you know, automotive history stats. So that's one reason why I appreciate these things. Um, and the fact that most of them are just like moving art, in my opinion, just the lines of them, the fact that a lot of the older 50s cars were motivated by World War II uh, designers who were working on uh, avionics things, and you can just see the fins and everything. I love all of that. The second part of it was the social aspect. There's something about you know being part of a car club or going somewhere and somebody has a cool car, and you're like, oh, I used to have a 68 Charger with a 383 uh, big block, you know. And, and you get to talking with them and you're like, oh, isn't this the first year that they came out with the torque flake, you know, and, and you can really connect with people, which is a beautiful thing to do to be able to connect with people because then you can go and drop ray bombs on them and say, oh, by the way, do you know Jesus? You know, but first, it's nice to be able to establish that social connection with people before uh, you swing the conversation into uh, more pertinent things. But anyway. Second really good reason to, to like the car culture. But if I'm being honest, um, there's a, a third reason why these things are kind of uh, desirable. And to set the stage for that, I'll confess that there have been times when 
I'm driving down the freeway and I'll see a car and I'll think to myself, that car looks weird. I don't know that I like that car. I don't like the design of it. It looks odd. And then as you get closer to it, when I get closer to it, and I see the Maserati symbol, or the Alfa Romeo symbol, or the Mercedes-Benz symbol, suddenly my opinion of it shifts radically. Now all of a sudden it's like, wow, what a gorgeous car that is. How innovative, how, you know, how outside the box. When before, when I thought it was, you know, a Yugo offshoot, then I, you know, not so much. Um, and so, if I'm being honest, the, uh, the third reason why I find myself desiring some of these things is because when I see somebody else driving my old car around, I get a little envious, you know, especially when a Ferrari goes by and there's this 22-year-old driving it, and you're like, <laughs> what is that about? Um, and so, you know, I'll confess that I get those feelings of envy, and sometimes we want those things just so other people can be envious of us because we see these things as symbols of honor, of respect. You know, and I don't, I'm not going to talk to that one person's motivation, but he specifically said, this is how you're honoring me or not honoring me. And a lot of times we'll chase after these symbols, these idols, because we think having that idol will bring us honor and respect and glory. And, uh, and that's when you really start getting into very unhealthy, sinful uh, situations. Um, because we're chasing after these things. Now, cars, watches, sneakers, purses, jewelry can be misused to instigate emotional reactions from others for our own personal glorification. As servants of the Lord, it is our duty, our calling to give God the glory right? To honor and respect him and to point people towards him and not towards us. And, and so seeking after, we just worshiped to a song that talked about wanting Jesus and not wanting the um, acceptance, I forget what the word was, but the uh, uh, praise or whatever of others. And that's what it really boils down to. It all, it all boils down to what is the motivation of your heart? What is the condition of your heart and why are you pursuing these things? Uh, we need to be really careful about that. Materialistic goods such as cars, watches, sneakers, purses, jewelry are, are not you know, bad in themselves, but it's how we choose to covet them, pursue them, chase after them, that becomes the problem. Now, these things, these materialistic things, are not the only things that I found myself contemplating on, well, what else do I covet? What else is it that I'm chasing after? Um, this just kind of like opened up, you know, the Pandora's box up. Where else am I, you know, needing to take a look at and, uh, and pray on and maybe repent of? And I think, uh, I think sometimes there, there are other things that we can uh, focus on. I wanted to, at this time, read from Romans 7, and it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Far from it. On the contrary, I would, not have come, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. So what is it to covet? Well, fortunately, we have a definition. Um, to set the heart upon, to long for, rightfully or otherwise, uh, to covet, desire, or feign, lust after. So it's one thing, it's one thing I believe, and this is my opinion, it's one thing I believe to set a goal. Like if your goal is, I want to one day have one of those fancy watches, you know, and you 
set up a little funds, you know, and you do stuff and you work towards it and you accomplish this goal. That is an awesome thing. I think there's a big difference between that and coveting something, lusting, longing for, fainting for. That is when your heart condition is really in a bad place. So where else, where else do I find myself maybe coveting or desiring? And I think for me and for many others, if you go to the next slide. Uh, oh, I thought I had another. How about the next slide? Okay, there we go. I think in a lot of cases, for me, we can tend to covet our youth. Uh, we pursue after our, our youth and the way things used to be, the emotional part of it. And a lot of it may have to do with the same thing as the watch or the muscle car, is I want to be beautiful by the world's definition so that people will desire me, covet me, you know, respect me. And so we chase after the illusion of youth. I have a, a quote here, and uh, if you go back a slide, I, yeah, that's me. Um, and I tell you why, I look back at some of those pictures back when I was young and buff, and today, the day after paintballing, I sure do miss that. <laughs> I miss not having the aches and pains that come with uh, certain uh, recreational activities these days. So there's a, a quote, and I've had it, uh, I've heard it said in many different ways, but I think this is the root of the quote. And it says, youth is the most beautiful thing in this world, and what a pity that it is wasted on children, you know. What is, and I think, you know, we all kind of nod our head and agree, but what a cynical thing to say. I mean, children need a longer candle because they're expected to burn longer. So, you know, would you take their candle away? I don't know. Um, so youth is another thing that we can chase after and covet in order to invoke responses from others. 2 Corinthians 4.16 uh, through 18 reads, Therefore, we do, no, we do not lose heart, but, through our own pers but though our outer person is decaying, yet our inner person is being renewed day by day. That's a beautiful thing. That, for me, gives me hope. Um, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all... Uh, comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Oops, I put this mic up. That might sound horrible. Um, but what an encouraging scripture this is. It, what a great reminder that all this will someday, praise God, be over. And, and we will be able to experience all the stuff we can't see. And for me, that's exciting. Uh, so, yeah, I went paintballing yesterday. And when I got home, my wife will tell you that I was walking around like I had an extra 30 years on me. Uh, I'm, still, I'm still working it out today. Um, but yeah, I look back at the old me, and that would have been nothing. And it's okay for me to try to do maintenance on the equipment that I have in order to get maximum length and use out of it. But that's a lot different than you know trying to cosmetically change myself, which for medical reasons, maybe that's okay. But again, if it's the heart where I'm trying to impress others, that's when you start getting into the gray areas. So other areas where I think people will chase after or covet things that, which are not healthy to them, if we go to the next slide. There we go. So sometimes we might look at a couple that appear from the outside to just be perfect. You know, they've got it all together. 
wow, look at them. I want that. And then we realize these are two models posing for a romance novel. And they probably don't even know each other. <laughs> probably maybe met over lunch. But we, we see these images of relationships and we're like, oh, if I could only have that. But I'm not willing to work to make myself the perfect spouse. I just want the perfect spouse. I want them to accept me the way I am because I ain't changing for nobody. <laughs> you know, and, and we, we idolize this, this image of what we want, this perfect utopia, but we're just not willing to work hard to get there. And um, so coveting relationships can get you, there's a lot of divorces going on right now because people could not be satisfied. They could not be content with the relationship they had. They weren't willing to put the effort into, you know, rebuilding the engine of that vehicle. Instead, they just want to discard it and go get a new model. Not realizing that that one's got more, that's a lemon, you know, and it's got more issues than the one they could have fixed up and restored, which would have been a classic. So, you know, uh, again, just, looking at things and going, wow, that would somehow make me happier. If I had that kind of relationship, people would look up to me and say, they've got it all together. Look at them. So I would just say that rather than uh, focusing on what I no longer have, I don't have now, or likely will never have, I need to choose to focus on and be grateful for what I have been blessed with, what I am blessed with currently, and what I will be blessed with in the future. I need to learn to be content with what I have and not covet things which may not be a blessing to me at all. It is far more important for me uh, and my choices in life to be pleasing to God than to be pleasing to the people around us. And, and I say that because, again, it's not the materialistic things or the relationships that are bad. It's me trying to leverage it somehow to squeeze honor out of people around me. Now, I say that, you know, it's better to impress God than for people. And the reason I say that is I don't need the approval of the world. And the reason and I don't need the approval of the world is, as we've been talking about for the last several weeks, because I'm complete. I am complete. And I don't need the world. You know? And not only am I complete, but verse 3, I am complete because for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. I can either chase after the acceptance of the world, which at the same time I know hates me because I am a child of God, you know, but somehow I am magical and I can win them over when nobody else has. I, I can make them not hate me anymore. Sure, if I'm willing to compromise everything, I can get them to not hate me. Uh, moving on to uh, the second part of this, Colossians 3. 5 through 10, we read, Therefore, treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you are also rid yourself of all of them, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. Amen to that. So it says, which amounts to idolatry. 
So let's look up the definition of idolatry because it's there's a lot of uh, phrases that we use um, where it's just part of our Christian speak. I think is the, the phrase uh, Christian ease, um, and sometimes we use them too much, and it's really good just to stop and what does it really mean? So idolatry, image worship, um, to worship an idol. I mean, it's pretty simple explanation. But it brings out another word that we use a lot, which is the word worship. We are here worshiping the Lord. Uh, We use the word worship a lot. And I found this definition more interesting. Worship, bow as an act of allegiance or regard. Prostate yourself before. Kneel down before as an act of reverence. So worship can also be said that anything you submit yourself to, anything that you make greater than yourself, anything that you prostate or lower yourself to is worshiping. And there's, you know, if we just really are honest about that, I think there's a lot of stuff that we worship, um, that we submit ourselves to. I mean, politics for one thing, which, you know, we're not getting to that topic, but there's a lot of little things that we will lower ourselves to and, and give a place of worship. And we need to be really careful about that. The next definition uh, from a different source, this one, this one was pretty good. Uh, worship, to kiss. Oh, that sounds sweet. But then it goes on to say, to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand to fawn or crouch to, uh, prostrate yourself in homage, uh, do reverence, adore, worship. To lick like a dog licking its master's hand. When a dog licks your hands, they are being uh, submissive. They are calling you their master. How many things are, have mastery, mastery over me in my life? You know. This message has really caused me to stop and say, you know, what are the things that I'm licking? <laughs> you know, uh, what, what has dominion over me? And if we're all honest, I'm sure we can come up with at least a couple of things that, you know, maybe we need to address. When it comes to the things of the world, uh, I need to be sure that I'm not fawning for, lowering myself to, licking the hand of a watch, a muscle car, respect, honor, uh, immorality, impurity, greed, these things that we're supposed to be putting aside. In fact, uh, if we go on to read verse 8, it says, But now you also rid yourself of all of them, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. And so I will ask this question rhetorically. Uh, you don't need to shout out your answers, but um, how's everybody doing with that? How's everybody doing with ridding yourself of anger, wrath, and malice? How's everybody doing with not having obscene speech uh, that comes out of your mouth? How's everybody doing with lying about bearing false witness to one another? I mean, these are things that we need to uh, submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit's convictions. And as it's revealed to us, you know, deal with it. Repent. Ask, seek forgiveness. Seek forgiveness from the person we've offended. Um, so if you have occasion to have difficulty with these things, you know, have you asked God to deliver you from them? Have you petitioned Him in prayer? Have you gone alongside to another saint, another brother or sister in the Lord, and confessed this weakness to them, opened up and said, hey, I'm struggling with this. You know, I saw a 20-year-old driving a Ferrari. I wanted to ram him off the road. You know, I'm struggling, you know. And be the person who has an individual that they can open up and be completely honest with and confess their struggles with is truly, truly blessed. And we should all, if we don't have one already, 
find somebody like that. Find somebody that we can open up to and, and, and confess these struggles and seek uh, guidance. And, um, so verse 9 goes on to say, uh, the second half of it, since you stripped off the old self with it, uh, its evil practices and have put on a new self. Uh, I think we stop right there. So verse 9. Strip off the old self and put on a new self. Well, if you can strip off the old self with its evil practices and put on the new self, it stands the reason that you can do the reverse, that you can strip off the new self and go and put on your ragtag, icky, gross old self too. And we need to make sure that as we're walking in the Lord, we maintain forward progress, that we're diligent, that we don't look back, that we're not trying to put on the old self. You know, and it, it maybe it's not a matter of completely stripping off the old self and trying to don, you know, uh, completely stripping off the new self and trying to put the old self on. Maybe we, we, keep, we mostly keep on the new self, but we put on the old socks or I put on the old fancy watch of evil uh, selfishness and you know, honor, self-honor seeking. You know, maybe we, we try to play the game where we're mostly new self, but we're gonna, we're gonna start reapplying some of the old sin that's comfortable to us. We need to be really careful about that. Um, so, uh, anyway. I think when we take off the old self, because the analogy for me is, you know, the image of clothing, wardrobes. You have the old wardrobe and the new wardrobe. When we take off the old self, I think it would be healthy for us to visualize we're taking off the old outfit because it's on fire. It's consumed with flames and it wants to burn you with it. We need to take off the old self before it takes us with it. And we want, we, for me, it's healthy to visualize the old self being on flames because when I take it off, I can now visualize it being a pile of ashes. And I can't put ashes back on me because it is gone. We need to have that same imagery um, because the reality is the old self, it's going to burn. It's sinful in nature. The old self is going to burn. Don't let it take us with it. Leave it where it's dead. Amen? So, what are our takeaways from today? The first takeaway is, verse 2, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. That's an important takeaway. Uh, the next takeaway is, Material things themselves are not good or evil. Uh, the responses they provoke in us can be holy or sinful. Takeaway number three, be willing to meditate on why you want or desire something. Um, I don't think uh, it's okay to be, or I think it's okay to be sentimental about something. Uh, I think it's okay to want something fancier because it's better made and it will last longer, uh, or maybe it's just comfortable or it performs the way we need it to better, even though it's more expensive. I think those are fine, but wanting something to impress others is where it becomes unhealthy and sinful. Uh, the next one, be grateful for what we are blessed to have had, what we currently have, and what we will be blessed with in the future. Be grateful. And we've talked about gratitude. If you really want to impress someone, be Christ-like. Uh, when you focus on things not of this earth, people are gonna notice. You will have a much bigger impression on them than if you show up in a 68 Charger. Uh, uh, the next one, I'm not sure if I put it in there. Okay. Nothing has changed since last week. You are still complete. 
And I think the last one, I think, yep, they do match up. Uh, strip off the old self like it is clothing that is on fire and put on the white robe of sainthood. Let the old self be turned to ashes that it can never be put on again. Those are your takeaway notes. I hope that we can um, agree that they're beneficial, maybe apply some of them, and in the process, become more Christ-like and make choices that are more pleasing to the Lord. And just remember that this too will pass. And oh, I'm so excited for what's to come. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we just... Uh, we thank you for what is to come. We pray that you would give us uh, a mind to focus on the eternal, a mind to focus on what's pleasing to you. Father God, we just pray that uh, we would have an impression on this world, that they would see us and see you in them, and it would just be, uh, would cause them to be awestruck and want to know what it is about us that makes us different. And we can say, do you know Jesus? Let me, let me tell you about my Savior. Father God, we just pray that you would uh, give us opportunities to have those kinds of conversations with people. Um, we pray that in preparation for those conversations, you would begin to uh, work in their hearts, uh, prepare the soil, that um, the words you give us to share with them would take root. Father God, we pray for this, uh, this community. We pray for this neighborhood. Uh, we pray that you would uh, prepare the hearts of all those around us in this neighborhood. Uh, prepare their hearts to be receptive to your gospel, to your message of salvation. That we would uh, boldly be able to go there and speak with them and, uh, and uh, introduce them to our Lord. Father God, we just praise you and we thank you for all of our blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.